Welcome to another Beyond Sunday podcast, Parenting Edition. I'm Peter Bam here with Dr. Tim Riley, and we are continuing our conversation on his book, First the Broccoli, Then the Ice Cream, which he is currently in process in revising. Dr. Tim, how's that going? Give us an update. Well, I'm revising the revisions of an earlier revision oh, of oh. a revised version of... I'm, I'm, in that the midst of sounds complex researching and writing about um, digital media, what, what I'm referring to as a digital childhood, okay, which has turned out to be uh, much more involved, yes, than I anticipated, but also has turned out to be uh, a topic that I feel like really needs to be talked about in more detail or whatever I have to add to that. So I'm going to take as much time as it takes to get it done. That's wise. When when did your first, the original copy of this book come out? About 12 years ago or so. Right. And so a lot of the parenting things on there don't change. I mean, these techniques are rock solid. They last the test of time. But some of the things around us change, and that's a huge one that parents um, ought to be better equipped to know how to parent through is this digital age. So thank you for diving in. Yeah. That. And I've been a you know, my hope is to be able to to pull together things that we've talked about all along and yes. say, well, here's how those things apply to this situation. And you're exactly right in saying that kids are created the way kids are created. And and whether you're riding around in a, you know, a, an ox cart or, uh, you know, a Tesla, you know, the times change, but people don't. Yeah. Kids, would, kids would, don't. And basic principles of learning and behavior do not change. Would you buy a Tesla? Not so much. <laughs> I'd want to ride in one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've, I've, it. I've, I've ridden in one. It's as long as you don't have to go too far. I guess it's great. Perfect. Well, uh, last time we talked, and and if you if this is brand new to you, go back to the start. Actually, there's a bunch of episodes prior to this one that are building blocks to get where we are here today. On the last podcast, we um, talked about creating, um, setting the stage for positive discipline. We talked about schedules, procedures, traditions, and um, that gets us when we start to understand that and do that well, now we can add in expectations and actually have some success with them. So that's what we're going to jump into today is expectations, maybe some specifics on discipline. Whoo, Dr. Tim Riley, get us going. Yeah. So I, I, you feel like this is probably a place that we could have started. I mean, we're seven or so sessions in and say, okay, do this. Um, and there is enough value and power in the things that we talk about that people can have some success just following procedures and doing it. But our goal, I think, or at least my goal, I don't know what your goals are. My, my, my goal has been to, to say, I want to give you enough background and understanding of how learning works, how behavior works, how motivation works. Yeah. So that by the time that it, uh, you know, I'm a distant memory in your rear view mirror, you still remember the principles involved. And if you need to make changes, you're able to make changes, not just follow some rote set of procedures. Having said that, now we're ready to talk about a road set of procedures. I love that. And believe it or not, um, some of my goals are similar to your goals in this. I also have other wacky goals, but that's um, I, I've been really blessed to walk through this. And I'm excited to get to some specific procedural things. Um, I'm, it's also been very helpful for me to learn the why behind them um, and more of dive into like what this is all about to do it in a healthy way. So um, we could have started here, but we didn't on purpose. And now here we but are. now we're starting here. Now, now. we're starting here today. Yeah. Listener, buckle up. Expectations uh, for the process. Let's let's get going. Dr. Tim, okay. take it away. So we're, we're going to talk about expectations at the, in three basic areas. One, expectations for the process, expectations for yourself as a parent, and that at a more specific level, how do you establish expectations for your kids and then communicate those expectations? So expectations yeah. for the process, uh, basically, you know, what's going on there is implicit in the statement, which is it's a process. Uh, you know, oh. discipline begins the day your kids become kind of aware of what you can do. And we talked even earlier about things that you can do with infants to begin to help them learn how to navigate their uh, environment. And, and so that's that's part of the process. And it basically continues until the last time they walk out the door on the way to their dorm room or their first job or whatever. So 
the implication of that is you don't want to get all wrapped up in any particular event. Mm. Um, that sometimes it will go really well, sometimes it will go not so well. Um, what you don't want to do is be distracted by those very high or very low moments, but stick to the process, stick to the things that you're learning here, continue to do that, and the outcome will tend to work out in the end if you don't get too drawn into that. So as a parent, I don't want to put my identity in the, in the times when, I, when my kid actually followed through. And I don't want to put my identity in the times when they absolutely did not. Yeah. You, you it's teach what you that. can teach in the moment and then go on to the next moment. And that, so the, 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 the image here that I use here is of, of a uh, potter's wheel. Have you ever thrown a pot? Ever done that? I've seen movies. Okay. All right. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, you start off with this like lump of clay, right? You just get a block, like cut a chunk of, clay off and you get some water and you start the wheel spinning. And if you try to turn that into a pot all at once, you squeeze it as hard as you can. What you get is a lot of clay spattered on the walls and on your bib and, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way, right? Pots are shaped gradually. So you can't do that with your kids either. You can't teach them all of this stuff in one shot. You, you have to do it gradually. You're gradually shaping that. But by the same token, if you don't keep the pressure on, the pot doesn't look any more like a pot from one day to the next. Mm. So you don't want to miss opportunities to teach, but you're teaching in increments. You're not teaching grand mm -hmm. sorts of uh, uh, lessons all in all in one shot. Right. Yeah. It's not the one TED talk that'll save your kids forever. Yeah. It's gradual. It's incremental. Yeah. And there's no there. You know, there are very very few things in life that are learned in one shot, right? right? And we we talked about that before, you know, putting your hand on a hot burner, that's probably one shot learning, but otherwise so, not. So that's the expectations for process, now expectations for for me as a parent. Yeah, so what flows from uh, the idea of that that it's a process is uh, you you know, what do you expect from yourself as a result and and to start with it just like it's okay. Right, so, kids misbehave. So not perfection. Yeah, mis normal kids misbehave. Normal kids misbehave a lot. Man, my kids are so normal. Yeah. <laughs> so, so those are teaching opportunities, right? Yeah. If you if your kid never misbehaves, then they're probably doing it behind your back, and you're just yeah. not you're just not in on it. Um, so, j just get a hold of the idea that kids are kids. That your goal is to get them out the door as adults, uh, ready to take on the adult world. That doesn't have to happen when they're in kindergarten, right? They don't have to know everything. They're not going to. Just take it easy, keep moving forward, te teaching, and, and things have a way of working out over time. Well, and, and I've seen this uh, in my family and many of you have seen it in yours. It's even from kid to kid. I mean, my I have an older brother, um, just brilliant guy, and, and but was more mild-mannered. And so perceivably, it's like he was picking up what my parents were putting down more consistently, more successfully, yeah. whereas I, I was not. You have not. a brother who's brilliant? Yeah, isn't that wild? And he's uh, quiet. He's brilliant and genetics, quiet. Genetics, go figure And we it. are, yes, we're total opposites. And, and actually, Pastor Greg uh, was, my brother was a pastor in Macomb, where Greg was from, so he was shocked when he met me. He was like, "You, wow, okay. But so he um, grabbed onto things very easily. It was, uh, I think it was easier for my parents in a lot of ways than it was for me. And then I have two younger sisters and different stories for them. So it's like yeah. um, every, uh, with every kid, with every person in your life, with every instance, uh, it's like the way that I am parenting, there's also extreme variables in the personalities of my kids. Yeah, yeah. But, and that goes to what we were saying at the outset is that, you know, the basic principles are the same. I mean, okay. learning wakes, works the way learning works. And if you understand that, then you can make adjustments within the context of different kids' personalities or their different experiences or, or, or whatever. So there's no right specific way to do everything, um, but there are things that you can count on that are so consistent in human nature and the, the, way, we're, um, the way we're created yes. that um, if you can apply them to that situation, they're going to work. Yes. So we've got expectations for process the expectations for ourselves. So in the process, it's incremental. It's not all going to change in one grand gesture or speech. It's it's a day to day Shaping keeping the pot, process. Day by day, yeah, yeah, keeping that. Uh, uh, what'd you say? Like on the Potter's wheel? Because I've seen this. I'm telling you, I've seen it in like so many movies. 
So it's you got to keep the pressure on. Yeah. Um, but you can't do it quickly. Exactly. And then um, expectations for yourself. It's okay. Kids misbehave. You're not going to be perfect. Normal kids misbehave. Um, uh, even though it looked like my brother didn't, he also misbehaved. By the way, if you live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, Matt Bay, pastor at Hope Lutheran. But <laughs> shout out to Hope. There's hope in De Pere. It's De Pere, right outside. Whatever. You don't care. <laughs> But the kids are also resilient, so we don't have to micromanage them in our parenting in every moment. And that really leads us into, then, what are our expectations for our kids? Yeah. And I guess the first thing I would say is that um, people who don't have expectations for their kids yes. usually get what they expect. Nothing. Um, and it's not only that, but it's... Um, if you don't have expectations, if you don't have criteria for behavior, then you're taking away opportunities for you to congratulate your kids on a job well done okay. because the job's not getting done. Um, and if you're trying to train them up in how to manage their own lives successfully, they need experience with that before they get out in the world. And if, if you don't give them practice with it, um, then you're taking away opportunities for them. So the the thing that I hear very often from parents is, you know, I try to get him to do this and he just won't do it. And then we fight about it. And so I just say, never mind. Mm -hmm. It's just easier. I'll do it myself. Um, and, and that's a telltale sort of indicator that the kid is now kind of in charge of the environment, right? They're saying it's just easier, which is true in that moment. It's just easier for me to pick up the toys. It's just easier for me to do that. It's taking a lot of time. We're fighting about it. But just easier turns into much, much harder over time because right. now you've got a kid who's developing a habit of noncompliance. They're learning that if they drag their feet long enough, way back when we talked about passive and mm -hmm. um, active noncompliance, right? They, if they're passively noncompliant, mom or dad will take care of it for me. I don't have to do that. So you're training them to shirk responsibilities and put it off on somebody else. So easier in that moment is easier for the parent, but it's not better for the kid. Right, yeah. And and another thing we talked about before is also this learned behavior. They learn that if they're just a stinker about it long enough, ah, mom or dad will pick up yep. my toys for me. Yeah, so they'll repeat that and, as and those, well. And those get to be habits. And, and you know, there's a, another conversation we'll have maybe later about how that process proceeds over time. Right. Okay. So um, when I think about expectations for kids, two general categories of that, one rules, um, second chores. And two things to keep in mind about rules or I, what I refer to as the two rules about rules uh, one is that rules without consequences are not rules. They're suggestions. A and kids are free to either follow the suggestion or not follow the suggestion. So if you don't have any intention of enforcing those rules, then they're not really rules at all. Okay. The second is that rules without a relationship is just about a guarantee for rebellion at some point. Okay. Um, that uh, um, just hardcore um, uh, aggressive reinforcement or enforcement rather of, of rules will get you so far. But at some point, if your kid doesn't have some reason to want to follow your guidance, it, it's going to get difficult. Yeah. You know, it's funny as you're talking about this, it's like as a, as a believer in Jesus, there's like a direct correlation to the law and gospel here. If it's all law, all law, um, at, at some point I'm just done with it. I'm going to rebel from it entirely. Um, because you can't live up to it I, for one Because I yeah. can't, right. And I'm going to fail and then, okay, so now I'm a failure? Well, what's, where's my identity? Uh, and Whereas with relationship, and for me, it, it means relationship with Christ, um, then, then – there's a reason for me to want to obey those laws. And when I mess up, I'm forgiven. So that's a really cool sidebar here. Um, but one thing I want to note is when you said there's rules on rules, type A people just got real pumped. So okay. write that down. In. Yes, rules on rules. Write and, that down, circle it. And so the rules on rules, uh, 
let's get into some of these rules to help us as parents because I think for a, a bunch of people listening, now's the time where they're like pencil is ready. Yeah. Let's put some let's put some uh ink or lead to paper. Okay. The tendency sometimes is to have well, two things. One, have lots and lots of rules, which is a mistake. Uh, the second is to not communicate those rules effectively or expect that somehow your kids automatically you know, absorb those rules by osmosis or something, that they know what you're thinking. So uh, the important thing about the number of rules is that there should be not very many. Oh. Uh, and there should be not very many, one, because you know, it's harder for your kid to remember it if there's too many, but probably more importantly than that is you're not likely to enforce them if there are a lot of, if you have a hundred rules that you enforce some of the time, that is much, much worse than having three rules that you enforce all of the time, right? It's not the specific experience that you're talking about. It's the culture of expectation for, yeah, we follow rules around here. And, and so, you want to make sure that there's a predictable process to that. You're not going to do that if you've got 100 rules, particularly if they're not well expressed somewhere. So I, I think in terms of four to six rules is probably enough. And your focus should be on things that I would refer to as non-negotiables. Okay. Right? So follow instructions the first time they're given. Okay. Keep your hands and feet to yourself. You know, those, those kind of things that just like, yeah, we're not going to have discussions about those things. Those are never going to change. Yes. But other things are the places where you can show some flexibility and you can have discussions with your kids about what's reasonable and what's appropriate and let them be involved in the process. Right. But there are some territory that's just inviolate. You're just not going to move from that. So, so Tim, is are these uh, contextual, like... Um, those four to six, is it really, are those more so based off of like what your specific family is like, or are there four to six just solid rules that fit for most families? Well, the, the two, and we'll get a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but okay. the, in my mind, the two rules that should always be enforced are follow instructions from a parent the okay. first time they're given. I mean, that just, that has to happen. And the second is any aggressive behavior is not okay. Okay. So that could be aggressive language. It could be aggression toward property, aggression toward pets, uh, aggression toward a sibling. Um, th those are the things you just don't want to let go. Um, and now that doesn't mean that you have to be um, overly uh, assertive or, or um, aggressive maybe in terms of how you enforce them, but they need to, those need to be attended to every single time. Right. And like gravity right away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you're going back to the model that we had before. It's not like, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset. I just mm -hmm. want you to know this is not acceptable. And every time this happens, you can expect me to respond in this way. Mm -hmm. That's going to give your cat a, a, a chance to learn. And, and it's helping create that safe harbor we talked about in the last episode. Yeah. Yeah, and the 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 notion is um, to create what I refer to as a, a culture of compliance, right? Uh, uh, and uh, again, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but uh, sometimes we'll hear parents talk about, you know, well, I, I'm going to pick my battles, mm -hmm. which usually means I'm going to wait until things are really awful, and, and then I'll do something about it, um, as opposed to. You know, if I get used to enforcing instructions, like, you know, if I say pass me the salt, I expect you to pass me the salt. If I say put your sink, your dish in the sink, I expect that you're going to do that. And if you don't, I'm going to enforce it. Then you get kids used to the idea of, yeah, I just, I need to follow instructions. Mm -hmm. If you wait till you're involved in something that's a much bigger, more difficult behavior and you're trying to contend with that, then you're going to have a fight. It's harder to do all those kind of things. So the, the kind of salesman approach here is the, this is the foot in the door technique. Got it. It's always easier. There's good research to support this. It's always easier to get something to someone to do a big behavior if you've gotten them to comply with a smaller behavior first. Yeah. Right? That's the foot in the door. And, and it's a lot easier to enforce those things than it is to enforce the other things. So you just you kind of get used to the idea of, yeah, mom or dad says something, I just do it. That's the way it goes. Right. And this is why this is why we ought to have less rules, the four to six than a hundred. Because uh, as we talked in an earlier episode as well, we want to we want to give many more encouragements to commands as well. So yeah. if we have less rules, then it's not just constant command, 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 rule, rule, rule. 
Um, there's actually, we're catching our kids doing the right thing. And, and when we say, hey, put that dish in the sink, and they get up and do it, we say, thank you for Great listening. Great job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah, and you're giving them some opportunity to explore within the rules, right? And then you could give them some direction without turning it into a formal disciplinary interaction. Absolutely. So, you know, some things like follow instructions the first time they're given. I'm a, I'm a big fan of writing things down, even okay. if kids are not able to read yet. You know, write the rules down, post them on the fridge huh. so that you can go and point to them and say, oh, remember, this is the rule here. Um, but particularly as kids get older, you can forestall a lot of arguments by having everything written down and you don't get into, you never told me that. Yeah. Yeah. I did tell you that. Well, I don't remember you telling me that. Right. It's like, well, it's here. Yeah. Right. This is the rule that you, that you broke. So follow instructions the first time, use appropriate language, be ready for school by seven o'clock, you know, those kind of things that are just pretty straightforward and concrete and measurable. Yeah. Right. Not be nice. Well, what does that mean? They have a different definition of nice uh, right. than I do. So they're things that are, are are nice and concrete. Yeah. So like in, in my context, in my house, we have a uh, a big calendar that we put up in a um, in a frame actually on our wall. Uh, that we've got a frame where the edges pop up and you can just put a new calendar in there. We write everything that's going on in the month. Like that would be a great spot for us each month to rewrite those rules. And actually um, – if they're consistent, the same rules as they should be, then the next month I could say, hey, Ben, can you write up our rules? Mm. Um, but then, then they're always there. We can refer to them. They're seen <laughs> every time we check the calendar for what's lunch today. I mean, today. I've, had, I've had people come into the clinic and they've, they've been fighting over rules for five years. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, the kid's got a completely different definition of what the rules are than the parent does, and they just never got around to just – reconciling that by writing them down. So, Oh, in my house right now, if, if we, if the five members of our house tried to list our top rules, they'd all be different. Yeah. So this is going to be not awesome. good. Yeah. Not good. It's a mess guys. So younger kids in particular, you want to stay away from rules, especially if you've got a kid who is more non-compliant, you stay away from rules about sleeping, eating, talking, not talking, toileting. Okay. What do those things have in common? Oh, gosh. Oh, this is an awesome this, this riddle. This is the quiz portion. Of okay, the name them again. Sleeping, eating, talking, eliminating, peeing, pooping. What do those things have in common? They all happen in rooms. Ah, I don't get it. Uh, what the, is it? The, the kid has complete control over those things. Got it. You can make them sit on the toilet, but you can't make them pee. You can make them sit at the table. You can't make them eat. You can't make them talk, not talk. You can put them in bed, but you can't make them sleep. So if you say, I'm going to have hard and fast rules about these things, and there are things that you can't really enforce that the kid's in charge of, then they learn that they have control of that situation. You're not, you're not effective in, uh, in, in controlling things. Got it. Got it. I always so tend to stay away also from... If you've got a, a difficult kid, you stay away from things that, and this maybe applies more to chores, but like things that have to be done, like feed the cat or, uh, you, you know, empty the dishwasher or whatever. If you've got a, a kid who's inclined to be a little bit more resistant and again, they learn to be passively non-compliant, I'm not going to feed the cat somebody's got to feed the cat or the cat dies, right? Uh, and so you're back in that situation of, oh, it's just easier to do it myself. The kid's learning to be non-compliant. Right. So you have things that are measurable, observable, and enforceable. Yeah. And, and how would that be different, though, than like be ready for school at this time? What do you mean? How would it be different? So uh, if, if that's one of my main rules that we write up on our planner now, um, that is like – how is that different than feed the cat um, or? Well, because nobody dies if they don't go to school on time. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit I mean, inside granted, every day. It's just a cat, but I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So very helpful stuff. Um, rules on rules. We uh, said let's focus on less rules and more. Make them observable, measurable. I mean, in your jobs, it's like, uh, great managers say, let's set some smart goals, things that we can actually achieve and know that we've achieved them. So we're doing the same thing with our rules for our kids. Uh, we're going to make a list. Um, 
And so we're going to actually write these down so the people around us can see them. Our kids can read them and we can refer to them when they're broken. And keep it, keep in mind that writing rules also controls parent behavior. Ah, um, because what you don't want to do in, in interacting with your kid is just be coming up with like arbitrary rules that you decide on the spur of the moment. There's nothing that's going to make your kid upset quicker than it's a moving target. They tell me this thing one day and this thing the next day. I never know exactly what I'm being held accountable for, right? So if you're writing down those rules, then you're saying these are the things I'm going to commit to enforcing. The other stuff we'll figure out how to manage. So that's rules on rules, but you said there's a second part, chores. Yeah, if we're talking about expectations, again, the two categories, rules, which we just discussed, and chores, um, and rules are more general in nature, uh, cover longer periods of time. They're always in effect. You, you always need to follow instructions. You always need to keep your hands and feet to yourself. Right. Those kind of things. And, and chores, we're talking about specific tasks at specific times done in a specific way. Uh, and um, in, in particular, it's important, I think, to think about what matters with chores. It's not you know, 10 years from now, you're not going to worry about whether or not the living room was vacuumed appropriately or whatever. What the real skill that you're teaching is just taking care of routine responsibilities in a regular way. Right? And so when we assign chores, we're doing things that are within the kid's capability. Um, and we're not trying to teach them, for example, how to operate a vacuum cleaner. Most people can figure that out. You flip the switch, you push it back and forth, the carpet gets clean. I mean, that's the way it goes. So you get some nice, neat lines in the, in the carpet. So it's like, no, you you need to take care of these things. So um, examples for, uh, you know, daily chores would be make your bed every day before school, take out the trash when it's full, check it before you go to bed. Wipe down the shower every time you use it, those kind of things. Um, and then weekly things might be do a deep clean on your room or vacuum the family room, something like that. Um, always some chores are in the child's particular area. So keeping your room clean or, or cleaning your bathroom or picking up the toys before you go to bed. But I also think it's important that they be assigned some things that serve the entire family. So some of the shared space in the house, they're doing something in the kitchen, they're doing something in the, in the living room, whatever. They're making a contribution to the, uh, the family. Right. Right. So daily chores, weekly chores, give them something they can do successfully and then encourage them. Cheer them on when they do it. Um, keep the number of rules and chores limited so that you're more successful. It's easier to do four rules and four chores than it is to do 100 and 100. Um, and then give them some ownership in their own spaces is what I'm hearing. So that yeah. my little five, seven, and nine-year-old can have success and start taking pride in their own room um, and how their chores can help them and help the family. The other feature I've mentioned here, because I listed some of those chores, they're all you know, do this thing by this time. Ah, uh, okay. Make it measurable. So there's a deadline. Um, it, it's not just open-ended, hey, you need to get your room clean. It's, I expect that this will be done by this time. Yes. And, and so, you know, if it's your room has to be cleaned up by noon on Saturday, then they have every minute up to 11.59 and 59 seconds and they're good, but if it's not cleaned at noon, then there's a consequence involved. So what we're teaching them to do is be accountable, but also giving them flexibility within that to learn how to manage their own time and their own process. Yes. Um, and as you suggest, giving them some accountability and ownership of the, of the thing. Yes. So even as an adult, when I set goals for myself, I make them smart goals. They're measurable. I can accomplish them. No one, I didn't accomplish them. And learn from that. Same thing for our kids. Yeah. And so we've got rules. We've talked about expectations today. Um, and then with both rules and chores, I love that we're getting into the real practical stuff. I hope you've taken great notes. Go ahead and listen to it again. Jot those notes down and join us next time as we continue in this series, first the broccoli, then the ice cream, and learn how we as parents can do this in a God-pleasing, awesome way where we actually enjoy being around each other and we can celebrate as well. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Any closing words? 
No. Excellent. See you next time.